Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to the large group to teaching lesson eight in the Christian story. Well done. You have been working through weeks and weeks of, of this story of the Bible, how, how God is working with his people and continuing his story through a series of promises. And we are almost at the end. We are seeing the pieces come together. I hope you enjoyed this lesson. I felt it such a breath of fresh air to see some hopeful pieces that God is going to deal with the heart problem that we've been seeing popping up. We've been seeing how, in this lesson, how God's promises continued through the prophets. And the next few minutes, we're going to talk about, about how Jesus connected to those promises. So as we've been moving through the plot arc, tracing the Christian story, we've gone through the whole Old Testament, pretty much while we've touched here and there, and now we're getting into the New Testament. But we learned from the beginning, after mankind rebelled, that God still chose to be in relationship with his people. And we've seen that again and again, week after week, even though there's been that major heart problem. And we started off looking at how God was doing uh, a work through covenants. And so the two big ones, just in review, were the covenant to Abraham and the covenant to David, these unconditional covenants that he was going to keep forever. So the Abrahamic covenant, remember, included people, land, a blessing for Abraham's descendants, and that those descendants would be a blessing to all the nations. And then last week we saw the Davidic covenant in which God promised a ruler from the line of David to have an established kingdom to rule forever. But where we ended last week, where Crystal taught us, was that none of those promises were fulfilled. Israel was at its lowest point in exile, the northern kingdom gone and scattered by Assyria and the southern kingdom in Babylon in exile. They're not in their land. There is no king. They are not experiencing blessing, and they can't fulfill the Mosaic covenant either in this, the sacrifices, the atonement that they were supposed to do yearly, the things we learned. None of those are able to happen. And yet you saw in your homework that even though they're at this low point, the prophets still clung to the promises. They still believed that God was faithful to his promises that he made to Abraham and David. And they prophesied about a future hope, something better and new, a new covenant that would come, and a new leader who would care for them forever. So, again, we have our chart, the books of the Bible. So, Ezekiel and Jeremiah, they're these prophets in the middle here. Jeremiah um, prophesied from uh, Jerusalem when it was being exiled, and Ezekiel prophesied from Babylon in exile. Then throughout the rest of the Bible, we see the rest of these prophets, and they, they spoke truth to Israel throughout, interspersed into the historical books and after. Israel actually is able to come back to the land. After the days of Ezekiel and Jeremiah, God brings them back. And the stories of Ezra and Nehemiah talk about Israel coming back to their land, rebuilding the city, rebuilding the temple. And yet, there was still that heart problem. So if you attend here at North Year, if you watch our sermons online, we're in a series on Malachi, which is way over here at the end of the Old Testament, the very last book. And from that book, we read and understand the people still had a heart problem. Their worship wasn't true from their hearts, and they were giving God wrong sacrifices. They were all about themselves still. And so we see the problem is still there. And between Malachi and Matthew, the beginning of the New Testament, there's 400 years. We call these 400 years of silence because there wasn't a word from the Lord. There wasn't a prophet or visions happening, and yet the people had to cling to these promises. They're awaiting a Messiah, a Savior, an anointed one who will come, and, and they'll see the covenants come through him and be fulfilled. They're looking for this new leader. But at the time of the New Testament, Israel, the Jews, were under the rulership of Rome. And so they still aren't free, they're not a great nation, and they're still looking for hope. And so today we get a little closer to that story, continuing these promises. We are going to look at how God's solution promises through the prophets, how Jesus connects to those. So first we'll look at how Jesus came to fulfill the promises to Abraham and David. Then we'll look how Jesus announced a new birth 
by water and the Spirit, and finally, how Jesus is the good shepherd. So we're going to kind of fly through those points, and hopefully you'll see pieces coming together, how this whole plot line has been leading to this point. We're getting closer and closer to the climax. And we are going to start with the first one, how Jesus came to fulfill the promises to Abraham and David. You can turn to page 94 in your workbook and read along with me. We're going to start in Luke 1. And in this passage, we're going to see how the oath to Abraham was remembered, the house of David is restored, and the people are rescued for a reason. So this passage in Luke 1, 67, it's a prophecy spoken by a man named Zechariah. He was the father of John the Baptist. So if you know the New Testament, you may recall that John the Baptist was Jesus' cousin, and he was the one who was called to go ahead of Jesus and prepare the way for Jesus as the Messiah. So when he was born, his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit. And you can read along with me in your books. Verse 68 says, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he said he through his holy prophets of long ago, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of those who hate us, to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham, to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. So firstly, we see that God didn't forget this covenant, the oath he swore to Abraham. So remember when Crystal taught us that, that God walked through those animal pieces. He swore an oath unconditionally that those promises to Abraham would come to pass. And Zechariah is saying that God will remember this holy covenant. And he's going to again raise up the house of David. In verse 69, he says he's raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of David. This term horn of salvation um, refers to just power and strength. The horn of an animal is their their strength and their power and their might. So that is uh, imagery that was used by the biblical authors. So this the strength and the power of salvation is coming up in the house of the servant David. Remember we learned last week about that that servant of uh, David and someone from his line who would always be on the throne. And so salvation is coming. The covenants to Abraham and David will be fulfilled. And this is a prophecy about Jesus coming to fulfill them, to do these things. They are not forgotten. God is faithful. But he's going to bring this rescue for a reason. You saw in here, salvation from our enemies, redemption of God's people. He will rescue us from the hand of our enemies in verse 74 and 75. But he says he'll rescue them to enable us to serve him. Oops, didn't get my, oh my. I don't know what just happened. (laughs) Oh dear. Ah, I think I've solved it. So sorry. Okay. Here we are. To enable us to serve him. All right, we're rescued for a reason. I rescued the TV. Got it. Um, So he enabled us to be rescued, to serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. So remember, Israel's problem was that they couldn't obey. They couldn't do the things they needed to do to obey God, their hearts were always turned aside and they were separated from God way back at the beginning in the garden because of their sin. They couldn't be holy and God was holy. And so this promise is saying that you've got rescue so that you will be able to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness. There's this beautiful promise that Jesus is going to make a way somehow for Israel to accomplish these things. He's going to deal with this heart problem so they can obey. We're going to learn more about how that happens next week and as we continue and finish the series off. But we're going to move next to how Jesus announced new birth by water and the Spirit. So in your homework, you looked at Ezekiel 36 and Jeremiah 31, and they pointed to this new covenant that God was going to bring to them. 
He, is, he talked about them, some different imagery of giving them a new heart. There's cleansing, there's forgiveness, all as part of this. I'm going to read Ezekiel 36, 25. I will sprinkle clean water on you, God says, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And so did you notice how often he says heart? I will give you a heart of flesh. So he's using this imagery of a heart of stone and a heart of flesh. Stones are hard. They are lifeless. They cannot do anything. You need flesh to pump that blood, right? To make something function. For life to be there. So a stone heart is dead. They needed life. So this reminded me of the story of Narnia and the wicked witch, she was the white witch and when she struck people with her wand, they turned to stone, they were lifeless. And yet Aslan, who represents, represents Jesus, would come and, and breathe life back on these people to give them the opportunity to actually serve him again. And so we see in the Ezekiel passage that there was both cleansing and a new heart. He said he would cleanse them, sprinkle water on them, and you will be clean. So the heart would be clean. Remember, the old covenant couldn't clean them on the inside forever. They needed to keep offering these sacrifices. And yet, God promises that one day he will clean you, and he will give you a new heart of flesh. Jeremiah says it's similar, but with different words. He says, this is the covenant I will make with my people of Israel after that time. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. He says, they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. So there's the cleansing piece and there's also this change in their heart. He will write their law on their heart. It's totally new change that's dealing with the heart problem, what this promise looks towards. And it's the spirit that makes the difference. He says, my spirit will be in you, and I will move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. So even though Israel has been in this struggle forever, they now look towards a hope that one day, somehow they will be able to follow God's decrees to look ahead to that day when the spirit inside them makes all the difference, that they'll be cleansed once and for all, and yet the spirit will also be there so that there will be this ongoing work in them, allowing them to turn their heart towards good, rather than always the inclination of their heart being evil, which is what we read in the story of Noah. This is going to deal with something on the inside. And so what does Jesus have to say about these promises? We're going to look at John 1, 3. It's also on page 94 in your booklet. Here we have a conversation that Jesus had with a Pharisee named Nicodemus. And in it, he's going to announce this new birth by water and the Spirit. So John 3. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born again when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, No one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. The wind blows where it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. So Nicodemus was a Pharisee, which meant he was a religious leader. He was a Jewish man who did all the right things. He would have obeyed the law. He would have taught the law. He would have done the the sacrifices and loved God. 
But Jesus said that none of these things is going to get you into the kingdom of God. You actually need to be born again. There needs to be a new life and a new birth because we know there's still this heart problem. And so he's pointing to this new need, this new covenant, this new heart that Ezekiel pointed to. Jesus says you must be born of water and the Spirit. And that water points us back to that cleansing that was promised, the sprinkling of water that Ezekiel 36 talked about. Cleansing from impurities and sins, being washed clean, and birth in the Spirit, this new life the Spirit will bring. It changes everything. Unlike the flood of Noah, the water that just went out and cleansed the earth on the outside, this cleansing changes the inside. And unlike the sacrifices of the Mosaic system that just dealt with things temporarily, the Spirit is going to help them continue to observe the laws. Even though they will continue to mess up, the Spirit is what sanctifies us in the continual life we live for God. When the heart problem is addressed, we're given forgiveness and also the ability to turn our hearts and to, to continue to grow in holiness with the Lord. And so the promises through the prophets, as we follow this plot line, the promises through the prophets are fulfilled in this announcement that Jesus is saying there's this new birth that's coming. And so finally, the last point, Jesus is also the good shepherd. So we looked at Ezekiel 34, which was this beautiful imagery of a shepherd and sheep. There was a problem, though. Israel had a lot of bad shepherds. Ezekiel talked about how all these shepherds, their past leaders, their prophets, their kings, their priests, so many of them had, had abused the people. Instead of being like David and Solomon, who we read about last week, who helped the people obey and experience God's blessing, the leaders had gone astray and had let the people wander. They had let the people go after idols. They had abused the people. They had caused them to be scattered. They had let them fall into destruction. But also in Ezekiel 34, God says his solution is that he will be their new leader. In verse 11 and 12, it says that I myself will search for the sheep and look after them. As a shepherd looks after his scattered flock when he is with them, so I will look after my sheep. Wasn't that beautiful and hopeful? Didn't your heart thrill at the realization that God is coming, that he was going to come to these people and shepherd them himself? And then in verse 23 and 24, he said, I will place over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he will tend them. He will tend them and be their shepherd. I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David will be prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken." Hopefully you talked about it in your group and saw that that was pointing ahead to Jesus, who would be that one, the horn of salvation for us in the house of David, who would rise up and rescue them from their enemies, who would be their shepherd. It was so amazing to get to these pieces in the Old Testament that are pointing us ahead to Christ, that are tying in how all of these covenant pieces are coming together. So let's flip finally to page 95 in your booklets where you have John 10 written out. See what Jesus has to say about this new leader, this shepherd that is coming. In John's gospel, in the chapters just before this, Jesus has been calling out the religious leaders of their day. He has been confronting them for their lies and for leading people astray and for having um, just a false understanding of who God is and what it meant to follow him. He actually even called them sons of the devil in John 8, 44. So he's been very strong with the religious leaders of their day. And he says in John 10, 7, Therefore Jesus said, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. So Jesus is saying here, I am the gate. So that's the imagery for this first part. He is the entrance into safety and salvation, as opposed to all of these other leaders. So he's saying, all who've come before me. So that includes those wicked shepherds, 
that Ezekiel talked about. And it includes the leaders who, have, who are currently there, who are not leading them into truth. The leaders who've come before are like thieves and robbers taking and not protecting the sheep. They come to steal and destroy, but Jesus says, I come to give them life. Enter through me and be safe. And then he moves on in verse 11 and says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up. This command I received from my father. So the old leaders, the kings, the priests, the current religious leaders, they're like hired hands. They don't care about the flock because they don't own it. It's not theirs. They're just doing it because it's their job. When you don't own something, you're not invested in it, you don't care for it, there's, just, there's, there's such a, a less responsibility for it and authority over it. When I was uh, younger, my family used to rent out our RV trailer to, to people to take during the summer when we weren't using it. And I was confused at first when we started doing this, how we had to take everything out that was ours, anything we didn't want broken. And my dad always required a damage deposit. I'm like, what is the problem? What are people going to do? And then I realized time and time again, the people who rented our trailer did not care for it. Things went missing. Once it came back and our whole pullout couch was destroyed and broken. And I was, I was aghast. I could not believe how they, people treated this. And I've realized that people, when you're a renter, when you are just a hired hand, like if it's not yours, you're not invested in it, you don't have to deal with it long term, you don't care for it. But the opposite is true for when we do, when we are invested. And Jesus is saying, I am the shepherd of these sheep. Not just any shepherd, the good shepherd. And not just any sheep, these are my sheep. They know me. I know them. You notice what level of knowledge he says? Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. This is the Trinity relationship. They know each other. And so we are known by Jesus, the Good Shepherd. And what kind of care does he offer them? He says he will lay down his life for them. We talked about what a Good Shepherd would do when we were discussing Ezekiel. And a Good Shepherd doesn't use and abuse the sheep. He actually puts them above himself and takes care of them. And this is what we're seeing that Jesus is going to do. He's not a renter that is just taking the sheep for his own benefit. We are his and he will care for us. Verse 16 says that he has other sheep, not of this flock. Remember, Jesus is talking to the Jews they are the ones who've been looking for this shepherd, right? They know that God has promised a shepherd that will be over them. He's promised himself. And yet Jesus is saying, there's others. It's not just you. And so we're reminded again of those covenants to Abraham that through your descendants, the world will be blessed. And so through Jesus, he is saying here, I'm going to bless the world because there are others around the world that are also my sheep and they will be brought in and there will be one flock and one shepherd over them. So it's not just a promise to the Jews, it's to the world, those outside of Israel. And he says, they will all listen to my voice, which implies this obedience. We know his voice, we listen, and it all connects to this new heart and the spirit turning us, this new birth that has happened so that there's this relationship. We know our shepherd, we know our God. And so we see that Jesus is the promised shepherd to come. He will fulfill the promises and he's announcing and bringing in the new covenant. But the how and the when we're going to learn more about next week as we finish off the study in lesson nine. 
So how do we respond to this today? Like most things in this study, again, application, a lot of it's in our minds. It's in changing the way we're thinking. It's in understanding the whole story and who God is. It also changes the way that we, that we know God and we understand how to pray to him. So last week, Crystal talked about how we can, we can pray and reflect in adoration, confession, and supplication. And so today, through this study, we can ad- adore our Lord, praising him because Jesus fulfills and God is faithful. Jesus is the fulfillment of the Abrahamic and Davidic covenants. In 2 Corinthians 1, 19 through 20, Paul says that every promise of God is yes in Christ. Jesus is announcing that the heart problem will, can and will be dealt with. And so we can praise God that the promises of his son are true and he gives us cleansing and forgiveness. We can also confess because we are those who have had stony hearts or maybe you still have a heart of stone. Maybe you haven't taken that step to yield yourself to the Lord and you feel that call today to confess your sin and come to him. If you have not received that salvation, we invite you to experience this new birth, have this cleansing and his spirit come in you to turn you towards his law. Or maybe you need to confess because as the pieces are coming together and you're seeing this all point to Christ, you realize that you've been making the Christian story about yourself. But it's about Christ. It's about God and his glory and how he is bringing a people to him for his name's sake. He is faithful. And so let's confess where we've made it about us and look to how we can make this more about the Lord. And supplication. Let's pray for those who need this new birth. We all know those in our lives who've got hard hearts or maybe they are straying and we are praying to the good shepherd that he would seek them out and bring them back if they are his sheep. And let's pray for continued obedience to his spirit and great confidence in the God who will fulfill his promises. So finally, where are we now? We have one week left to finish off this plot arc. We've seen that God has worked through these promises all the way along. But remember that the promises to Abraham, the promises to Moses, they had a ratification ceremony. They were made official and brought into into, into fruition through these ceremonies. The covenant with Abraham was ratified when God walked through those animals. And the covenant with Moses was ratified when Moses sprinkled blood on the altar and blood on the people. So how will this new covenant be ratified? How will it become official and come into place? That is what we will study next week in our homework. And we'll wrap things up in the whole story. We are so excited that you've been with us on this journey. And we hope you enjoy wrapping up all the pieces as you study and discuss um, over the next week. Let me pray for us. God, you are so good. You are the God of this story. It is about you. You are glorious. You are faithful. And we praise you for your son, that these promises are fulfilled. They are yes and amen in Christ, and that by your will and your plan, you've chosen to save us, to make us your flock. And I pray that you will um, draw our hearts ever more to you. By your spirit, will you turn our hearts to obedience to your law. Help us to glorify you in all that we do. We love you, God. Help us love you more. In your son's name we pray. Amen. You can head back to your groups.